Okay, great. Well, welcome to the March edition or the second March edition of the Dapper Community Call. You know, today we're going to talk through, I'm going to share my screen here with the agenda. So hopefully you can see this. So the agenda that we have today is that um, we're going to kick it off with a demo from Haishi on showing how we can do tracing and metrics through PubSub. We've shown tracing and metrics before. In fact, last week, Young Boo showed it for tracing and metrics. Where we do direct call to call invocation. But this time, we're going to show it that you not only have it over call to call invocation, but also using the PubSub mechanism. So this is one of the distinct advantages that Dapper gives you, is that you can see tracing and metrics across all the types of building blocks we have, not just you know, particular ones. Yaron is then going to show you how we introduce a topic scoping with inside topics inside PubSub. Um, then Shalab will just talk to us about some of the new security plane work that we've done, security work that we've done, and also on um, improving um, a health endpoint API that we hooked up into the underlying hosting platform, in this case, particularly Kubernetes. I'll give you a little update on where we are with the release, particularly the 6.0 release, and what's going forward with next after that. And then we will open it all up for questions uh, for you to ask. And as always, any question is valid. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point, um, and I'm going to hand over to Haishi to do us a demo of tracing and metrics with PubSub. All right. Thank you, Mark. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. All right. Okay. So cool. I will just do a quick demo of distributed tracing uh, through PubSubs. So initially, what we had is the distributed tracing across uh, Dapper uh, service invocations. Uh, if you've seen the earlier demos, uh, you can see how we can trace uh, the call path across distributed calculator application. And then uh, we got the feedback that you want to see the uh, distributed tracing across PubSub messaging as well. So this is what we did. So here, uh, what I'm going to show you is to how you uh, can see the, the distributed tracing uh, when you use messaging as well. So I have a uh, Zipkin running locally uh, as a container. Then I'm just going to launch a bunch of uh, uh, Dapper processes. Um, here I'm using the standard Dapper, uh, Dapper samples, the PubSub sample. There's zero modification to the code. And uh, if you see the um, components folder, So many screen, um, okay. And you can see I have a, a custom uh, tracing uh, config file. This is how you enable tracing. And I have the Zipkin exporter defined. But I, did, um, I, modif uh, I didn't modify any of the code. So I'm just launching the front end. This is the front end to, to send messages. Then if I can move this guy out of the way, somehow, anyway, I'll just move the window down. And I will just launch the uh, node subscriber, as well as the JSON, uh, I mean Python uh, subscriber. So there's uh, uh, no modification to the code. And if I bring back the Visual Studio code, and you can see this is just as before. This, this is a standard Python subscriber code. There's no modifications. Just as before, there's no Dapper library. There's no annotations, nothing, right? You're just doing the, the regular pops up using Dapper. So now I'm going back to the browser. I have the Zipkin, which is um, when the application launches, it some, has some traces already. So I'm going to send a couple of uh, messages. So I'm going to send like, uh, this is a message to uh, topic A, I will send to topic B, and I will send to topic C. Okay. 
Uh, I think both subscribers, they subscribe to topic A. So what you should see here is that when they send to topic A, you can see the message is flowing from the reactive application uh, to both a uh, Python uh, subscriber and a node subscriber. Mm -hmm. And if I go back, and this I believe is the uh, topic B, right? It only goes to the node subscriber. And similarly, uh, if you look at topic C, it only goes to the Python subscriber. So you can, you can see this, um, how, how the components are linked together by messaging. So how we did this was that because Dapper use a cloud event as the standard uh, message uh, envelope, so we just uh, stick in the, our coalition ID um, into the uh, message metadata so that we can carry that around. And you can use uh, features like the, the Zipkin feature or uh, uh, Azure uh, uh, App Insight uh, to see the dependencies, um, just similarly as you, you see uh, in, the, uh, in the direct invocation case. Uh, don't don't mind about this. This was some some other test I did yesterday. So let me try to uh, change the filter just to clean it up a little bit. Uh, maybe I was too aggressive. Let me just. Mm, maybe ten minutes earlier. So this is what we. Uh, what you should see just happened. There's actually a, a nice little animation. If you have multiple messages, you can see how many messages are floating through the each wire. Um, but regardless, I mean, Zipkin doesn't know this is a through messaging. It just considers it's the same dependence tree is, is rendering. So there you go. That's my demo. You don't need to do anything, anything special to enable this. You just enable tracing and everyone, everything should just work automatically. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any questions on that? If so, either open up your mic or just put, put something in the chat window. Okay, if not, put them in the chat window and then we'll move on and show you our next demo, which is with you, Yaron. Yeah, thank you. So let me share my screen. Yeah, we can see it. All right, great. So today we're going to be talking about scoping for pub subs. Uh, in the last community call, we basically introduced scoping for components so that an application um, can scope a component for a given namespace and also more granularly for a given application ID. So for example, an application that wants to consume a state store, um, you can now specify only application one can consume Redis. Um, and then, you know, by default, um, by extension of that application to an application three will not be able to. So we introduced um, one of those features for specific, specifically for pub sub, uh, which is quite powerful in terms of um, authorization for topics for both producers and consumers. And the nice thing about what I'm going to show you now is that it works independently of which pub sub component you're using. So this is one of the nice uh, benefits you get with Dapper where you get added functionality on top of some messaging pattern like PubSub, uh, which will just work with any uh, PubSub component, whether it exists today, or if you come in and um, contribute a new PubSub, um, it'll just apply to that too. And again, it works on every platform, Kubernetes or not, um, and runs everywhere. So by default, um, an application that uh, uses Dapper for PubSub can publish and subscribe to all topics, which is what you'd normally find in, in most pub subsystems. Um, but then uh, we're working uh, with a customer and we had this um, discussion about uh, implementing specific scoping for applications where somebody could come in and say, hey, you know what? Actually, I want application one to only be able to subscribe to a um, certain list of topics and I uh, want application um, three, for example, to be able to publish to a, a certain list of topics. So basically, uh, whitelisting subscriptions and um, public publishings. So we, go, we went ahead and implemented that. 
And what we have here is a Node.js app, and those who know the Dapper samples will recognize it. It's just the, the pub sub sample. So this is a, a regular Node.js application that subscribes to topic A and B. And those are the endpoints where um, those events will come in from the Dapper runtime to invoke them. So this is an endpoint for topic A, and this is an endpoint for uh, topic B. And this is the Kubernetes YAML for um, the pub subreddit. So let me just go ahead and remove this. And this is what you'd normally find um, in our samples, but for version 0 .6, uh, 0 0.6, we basically enabled those three um, fields, which we'll um, now explore. So the first thing to say is that this feature is not, um, it's not breaking change. So um, if, if you're basically using Dapper PubSub without these properties, you can just go ahead and do that and you'll continue to be able to publish um, and subscribe to, to all topics. But then we have the concept of allowed topics and what allowed topics allows us to do is basically say, for this specific component called message bus, for, which is PubSub Redis, um, I'm only allowing um, applications that either consume or produce a message to only interact with topics A and B. So if a new application comes along now and uses pub subreddits and tries to publish a message to topic C, it'll not be able to do that, or it'll also not be able to subscribe to topic C. So he, this is basically um, a whitelist for a, a given uh, set of topics. Now, allow topics is not a required property. We could remove it, and um, we could impose publishing scopes and subscription scopes, um, regardless of, of allow topics. And the next thing we have is, okay, so we've basically said that only topics A and B are allowed for this specific component, but now what I actually wanna do is, I wanna say app one cannot publish to any topic, um, whatever it is, and application two can basically publish to uh, topics A and B. Similarly, with subscriptions, we're taking application one and we're only allowing application one to subscribe to topic A. So, this is um, a list, a delimited list, so you can put uh, as many applications as you want here um, with a comma delimited list of the topics that you want. So um, again, we have uh, topics A and B for pub subreddits, and then we're basically saying application one cannot publish to any topic, application two can publish to A and B, and app one can only subscribe to A. So let's see how that works. So we have um, this no subscription to topic B is not allowed. And that's because um, we're only allowed to subscribe to topic A there. So um, this is the application that's running and we can see that it basically filtered the topic and let's validate that by running um, application two. So I'm gonna run it again and I'm gonna run the sidecar with an app ID of app two. And if we look here, we can see that um, application A can only subscribe to topic A. So first of all, um, I have topics A and B for the allowed topics here. So let's see what happens when we try to publish to a topic C. And I'm gonna uh, publish a, an Edgar Allan Poe quote here. And uh, if I press the send request, we can see we get an error message and uh, Dapper basically says topic C is not allowed for app ID application two. So we get a, a pretty clear and defined error message there. Um, and now if we um, publish to topic B, so we get a 200 okay. And we go back here and we see that um, we, we got the subscription for the message because we're running as app two. And if I'm going to rerun this as app one, we don't see anything because application one is only allowed to subscribe to topic A. Uh, and this is, this is basically it. So this gives you a very granular approach to basically limit applications from uh, a set of topics and then also be able to specify very granular scopes where certain applications can only publish or subscribe to a certain uh, given topic. And again, this works for all of the supported Dapper PubSub uh, components. This is not done on a per uh, component basic. All right, questions?
And I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. All right, no questions. Okay. All right. Then uh, thanks. That's a great demo. Um, I think the scoping side of things inside Dapper is going to be pretty important. Um, and it's, we, it's kind of, we think of it as part of the security side of things in terms of how we make sure that we provide scoping and security. And, and that's kind of a strong emphasis across all of the Dapper building blocks we do in the Dapper itself. Um, so on that note, uh, let's move on to uh, talk get Shelob to do his walkthrough and his uh, talk about um, on the, uh, the health side and how we're putting more security into um, the system services. Yeah. Hi, so let me share my screen. Your Honor, I believe there was a question on the chat window from Jason. Yeah, there is one question. Well, 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 well let's pick that question up at the end. Hi, so can you all see the, uh, my screen? Yes. yes, we can. Yes, so um, today I'd like to talk about the new capability that we added in terms of MTLS. So last community call, we talk about the MTLS between Dapper sidecar to Dapper sidecars. Uh, in this release, we're gonna have more enhanced security in which we're gonna have secure communication between Dapper sidecar to the system services. So now it Dapper offers this mandatory MTLS between Dapper sidecar and system services, which is Sentry service, which is certificate authority, and the placement service and the operator. So how it works is like when uh, when MTLS is enabled, the Sentry it uses the same Sentry service that writes a root and issuer certificates to Kubernetes secret, uh, which is scoped to the namespace where only the control plane is there. So no one is no other thing no other no other entity is able to write to the control plane. And when, uh, if you see this communication, like how it works is like when the depot system services start, they automatically mount the secret that contains the root and issuer certs, and which can be used to secure the gRPC server, which then Dapper sidecar can use to talk to. So, uh, so when, uh, so that way, all the communication now between Dapper to Dapper and Dapper to system services are now secured under MTLS, which is enabled by default. So that gives you the more security, more secure version of Dapper, which is completely under MTLS. And how the updating root and certs have done, it's, it, it works the way like you can have your, you can update them and restart the, restart the secret restart you can edit the secrets with having all the new certificates and then you can do the recommended way to do this to perform a rollout restart of deployment so all the uh, concepts that i just talk about like how it works and how to update the certificate that will be uh, there in the concept section very soon and that you can go through it and you can shoot any questions that you want to have it uh, so in the next topic I would like to, so the first thing before going to the uh, readiness and liveness probe on health API, do you have any question with respect to the secure communications with MTLS between sidecar, sidecar and system services? Okay, all right. So the next thing that I would like to talk about in this, uh, in the, the new features that we added this release is that um, we have added the health API to determine the Dapper health state. If you see here, like uh, there's a new health API that is exposed, which listens, which is on the same uh, Dapper port, which gives, which can be probed to determine the Dapper is healthy or not. So in this slide, I will talk about in the context of Kubernetes, however, the same, can the same API can be used with any orchestrator, but I'm gonna scope down to the to Kubernetes. So how the kubelet, if you see here, the, the kubelet that uses liveness probe to know when to restart the Dapper sidecar. So there are scenarios what happens when there is a deadlock and sometimes restarting a container in those state can help. 
So we want to, we have provided the liveness probe and also the readiness probe which Kubelet uses to know when a depper site car container is ready to start accepting traffic from app. And when it is not ready, pod is not considered ready and it will be removed from the load balancer. So to perform a probe, what Kubelet does, it sends an HTTP GET request over the health Z endpoint, which is on, which is which uses on the same port 3500 by default. So if health API returns success code, it considers Dapper is healthy, otherwise not healthy. Then Kubelet kills the container restarted in case of liveness probe. So both the readiness and liveness probes now it is auto injected by the sidecar, by which both can ensure that traffic does not reach Dapper sidecar container that is not ready for it, and the container restart when they fail. So that enhances that enhances the capability to deterministically re determine whether Dapper is healthy or not. So with that feature, it is it is it, it becomes very easy for app to it becomes very apt to use the health API to know when to send traffic. So with that, uh, do have do anyone have any question on about health API? And we have the documentation that talk about the health API spec and the concept. Yeah, no, this is super important, Shalab. So thanks for sharing. I mean, this is all around our continued push to make sure that Dapper integrates well with the hosting platforms, in this case, Kubernetes. Um, you know, of course, Dapper will run on multiple hosting platforms in time. Um, and here, of course, we want to make sure that we hook up to the, the health APIs inside Kubernetes with the liveliness and readiness probes so that we um, make sure that Dapper plays nice in that hosting environment. Um, and this is all towards our continued push to making Dapper uh, uh, you know, a V1 release and making sure we focus on fundamentals like security, uh, reliability, availability in this particular case, um, scale, perf, um, and then of course, a lot of end-to-end -end testing and load testing. All right, thanks, Shalab. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Mark, uh, just one important thing to note here is that the uh, health API are not specific to Kubernetes. So for example, if you're taking yes. Dapper and you're on Docker Swarm or whatever, you would just configure uh, Swarm to do the, the health checks on the end API endpoint the Dapper um, exposes. So in Kubernetes, we have the sidecar injector here in the slide, and this basically configures um, Kubernetes to use that endpoint as its uh, readiness and liveness uh, checks. Yes, yes, yeah. good clarification. Yes, thanks. Thanks. Uh, all right, then, yes. Mark, I'll Okay, yeah, I mean, the thing we want to continue to stress is that, because we get this question time and time again, people keep saying, you know, is Dapper tied to Kubernetes and to Docker? And the answer to both of those is no. Dapper is not tied to any particular hosting platform. Um, everything that we build is, is independent of the platform. Um, and so as we look towards looking on hosting this on other platforms, such as Docker Swarm, Service Fabric, Mesosphere, uh, Cloud Foundry, whatever people take, to choose to implement them, we will find the best place to integrate those. Of course, Kubernetes is the most predominant one, so we tend to focus on that first, but that, that's not the goal of, um, of Dapper is to be tied to any hosting platform. Uh, likewise, uh, with containers, uh, you do not, uh, you can run Dapper, the system services, as well as the um, sidecar process, sidecar as an independent process. It does not have to be containerized. Good. Um, any questions on this? Because I think this is a pretty interesting piece of work that's happened in this release. If not, uh, let me go back and just share my screen. Um, and just take you through some of the things that we're doing with our milestone plans. So We've just finishing up on 0 0.6 milestone. Our aim is to release 0 0.6 um, runtime release along with the CLI and the SDKs, updates to the SDKs uh, this Thursday. And you see our milestone plan here. The key ideas was to reduce some particular P1 bugs that were reported. Um, we talked about this feature scoping proposal inside here. One thing we didn't show this week, which maybe we'll do next time, is that we've worked on doing SSL for Azure, for Redis caches in generally, uh, not just uh, Azure Redis cache, but any, any Redis cache. So we support secure uh, communication with that. 
Um, we continue to work on some of the observability improvements, which you saw there with Haishi in terms of your know, pub sub observability and also making sure that the metrics and the dashboards that we showed last time. And then particularly then some of the integration pieces that we showed with the MTLS work with the system services. Um, and we'll have more coming along here in terms of security issues. And then we started long haul test, building out long haul test framework. And I think we built one test in there so far. And you'll see this carry on to the 0 0.7 milestone. So those are the major themes. And of course, you can always just track this all inside our public milestone here. This is all the work that I've got done inside here. This is uh, the work that we've currently just reviewed and about to close out. And here's the last few bits of the milestone that are in progress. Um, mostly writing some docs and making sure that we um, do some you know, documentation around the issues that we've been doing. So you can always come in here and comment on this. Um, and then really what we're trying to do now is we're trying to release on a fairly regular cadence of about every three weeks, which is a little bit more aggressive than we've done in the past, but we want to make sure that we can address issues fast. So you'll see that we've opened up the 0 0.7 milestone here already. There's a few things, items we've put in here that we're thinking about, uh, but generally, once we ship 0 0.6, we'll take up the same theme, similar themes that we've done inside here in terms of the plan for a 0 0.7 plan. We can go and look at like this. There'll be one that will get published at the end of this week. And to a large degree, I think you'll see the long haul tests and end to end tests kind of remain inside that as we keep driving towards a stable V1 release. Um, and then looking, of course, across priority reported bugs and then of course then features that you upvote in terms of the community um, you know as well as you know cut direct customers we're working with I'll always put out a call if you are taking Dapper into production and you want our help uh, we're more than happy to jump on a call with you and to talk about your needs what is it that you're thinking of building um, and give you some advice divine design advice we're very keen to have as many customers take Dapper into production uh, we have quite a few at the moment and more arriving each week um, and all of this will help stabilize the release and get it into a good state so watch out for the 7.0 release as we get into this week and watch for our announcement of 6.0 um, and please take the 6.0 release try it out give us feedback tell us what you like what you don't like just raise issues um, we've been going through recently on all of our repos both the runtime the sdks samples and cleaning up a lot of the issues closing down the old ones replying to people prioritizing the issues uh, tagging them with the labels um, so you should see in a fairly good state um, and we intend to do that on a regular basis so we don't have stale issues inside there um, outside of that you can actually see inside here that uh, we still have um, some projects that you can see for particular uh, themes inside their security bugs and feel free to go and check those out so at this point, um, I'm going to stop sharing and I will hand it over. And, you know, we have about 25, 30 minutes. Um, this is open question time. Um, this is you know, time for anyone on the call to be able to open up, ask a question. Feel free to open up your mic and ask a question or post this in the chat window. Any question is valid whether it's something about the milestone, whether it's something about a particular feature, whether it's something about a particular issue, uh, whether it's about a little API call, whether it's a little bit of a rant, you know, we want to just hear it all. Um, you know, there's nothing that, you know, is off the books. So with that, far away with any questions you have. Also, tomorrow is April 1st, so if anyone wants to prank us in a pretty cool way, go ahead and do that. <laughs> like Dapper is crushing, uh, crashing with the latest master branch build right before we're going to release the version, things like that. That's, um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, this question published here by Luke. Are there plans to allow for adding custom metadata to topics such as correlation ID? Uh, hey, look, so is, is the question um, if we're going to add custom metadata coming from the users, uh, from the app itself? Because for correlation ID and Hashi, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we do have correlation ID and subject inside the, the cloud envelope message, do we? Yeah, that's how we carry the correlation ID around. 
However, that, uh, that subject field is maintained by Diaper Sidecar. So it's not uh, directly exposed to the uh, user application code. But I do, do see the, the, the scenario where you may want to control the correlation IV yourself. So maybe we could allow a certain interaction that we can take the correlation ID the user supplies. Um, I would suggest to, to create an issue or proposal on the GitHub and we can follow up on that. I think it's a valid scenario. Yes. Okay, good question. Yeah, I always feel, feel free to open up issues. Um, that's the best way to do it. And if you want to label them at the same time, like, uh, you know, feature ask or things like that, that's always a good thing to help, you know, just triage and look at, through them in terms of uh, how you see the issue. Hey guys, I got a quick question for you. Are there, um, are there any plans to allow um, any extra tracing or telemetry data to be sent? Like, are we, thinking about having the, the opportunity to open up kind of the, you know, or put an API in place for telemetry and tracing so you could send some, some arbitrary information that may be application specific that's not just metrics around, you know, calls coming into the Dapper sidecar and et cetera. So this is Yangu. So your, your question is that, um, why not uh, expose the, the metric or log or tracing API to the user app and user web will use that use use this API to uh, emit the metrics and logs and tracing. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got a couple of questions about that. I mean, but exposing the uh, diagnostic API such as log and metrics and trees is not that simple because. If the user is like emitting the lots of or like bunch of uh, metrics and logs, and that side call may need to have some sampling or um, sampling features on that on on side call side, and also we need to provide some SDK to the user side to use that uh, the logging feature. So we are considering, but we don't have immediate plan for that. Okay. Yeah, I guess, Lynn, your question is a bit like along the lines, instead of including, say, in Azure uh, App Insights SDK and writing it out there myself, I can just have a log API that I call and it writes it out to the, uh, the, logging, the logging database, of my, or logging store of my choice. Yes? Correct. Yeah, yeah. so then you've got kind of an agnostic way to, to write to various logging stores or emit various um, you know, telemetry or metrics. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's as Young Kabu replied, I think it's certainly something that we want to do on the roadmap. Um, we just, at this point in time, it's, at the moment, we've just got it down to tracing the metrics from the Zappa runtime itself. It's certainly, uh, we, yes, we, it's certainly something that we think about on our roadmap and it's something that we intend to consider. So okay, please cool. upvote it if you think it's important. We'll do. Uh, Ricardo replied, correlation IDs on one of these, uh, another one a type, another one is type, but uh, cloud events also supports extended attributes, as you mentioned in. It's related to the question we had before about yeah. the cloud event envelope. Correct. Okay, any other questions in terms of you know, features or timeline? And if it's easier to open up your mic and talk that way, feel free to do it that way. Yeah, Mark, I was just wondering because there doesn't seem to be any good information on this, but what is the, you know, the flows for the different things between the services and the sidecar containers? In other words, what's required for what? It would be nice if there was a little documentation more on how the internals work. Right now, it's a black magic box. Uh, so are you referring to the, which piece are you referring to? Are you referring to the system services that we showed in that previous slide? 
Or are you referring to? Right. Okay. Right. In other words, how are you know how are the communications between the sidecars orchestrated to know what's going on? That type of stuff. Just like a little some something somewhere would be nice just so you get an idea of what's going on so if you're troubleshooting you have an idea of where to look okay so in particular there's two places but one is that between the sidecars themselves uh, which talk over um you know, which uh, and then there's between the sidecar and the actual system services so are you interested in saying saying you know what are the types of logs i see and what's the sort of um Oh, in other words, for the different for the different things like you have pub sub, you've got actors, you've got you know just the basic service location. In other words, it'd be nice to know what the flows are of those things and what what each thing depends on for communications to actually pull them off. Yeah, so okay. like a flow diagram. Yes. It, yeah, that that would be fantastic because. Basically, it's a lot easier to work with something when it's not a black magic box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we have that data uh, written down, but obviously diagrams will be much better as they convey it in a much simpler way and people are visual. Or even some links just to where that data is and some of the main stuff because it's probably buried inside of issues where you would never guess that would be where it is. And yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I've never it been able to stumble off, across it. It is, it is buried, yeah, uh, for sure. I, I, are you referring to which one are you referring to, your Are you referring to the description of the sentry service, or are you for example, to... um, concepts for service invocation and pub sub? So in those two sections, we explain what the what the flow is exactly between uh, dapper sidecars to dapper sidecars, whether it's through a message bus or um, JRPC and how that's done. But I think we can uh, maybe you know do better if we visualize it and put it someplace central that people you know just immediately get what's happening um, when you either publish a message or try to invoke another, another service directly. So, so yes. currently they are in the documentation itself, we are and they are not buried somewhere in the issues, right? No, 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 they're not in the issues. They're, yes. they're so they're in the documentation, in okay. But yes, uh, we, we do have that information in our doc, someone is right. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. I, I, I've yeah, not I, stumbled across them and I've kind of looked for that, so. Are you referring to, for example, I mean, what the way we try to organize our docs, which is an interesting discussion, is we try to organize our docs where there's an overview, and then we have concepts, the, uh, the concepts docs, which describe how things work. Um, and so you read those in terms of how does service invocation work, how does state management work, how does security work, and then those in turn point to the actual ha um, the how tos in terms of how to achieve a task. So, for example, how do you set up a Redis store to do state management um, is what in the how-to section. So our docs are generally along those lines. So what we tried to do is inside concepts is where we put all that information around what's inside the black box. If inside one of those concepts, for example, you want to know more about the service invocation one, which I published, I've, I've just put into the chat window, and you don't think there's enough here, and I admit that this probably could do with adding a bit more, for example, there is actually an open docs issue that inside service invocation is a retry mechanism, uh, which isn't talked about here and it should be here. Mark, are you um, sharing your screen? It would be good if you can share your screen. Oh, no, I'm not sharing my screen, but let me share my screen. Uh, let me share this screen here. So for example, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, so this is, um, I was just going back here a moment. So inside the way our docs are organized is that we have you we have we have docs here and we have we have concepts. And underneath concepts, we try to make sure that each one of the conceptual areas that you want to understand more about is described here. So if you want to know conceptually more about actors or a little bit more about how bindings work, or for example, under service invocation, this is the topic on service invocation here. And inside here, we try to unravel the black box. So if you want to know more about service invocation and how sidecar sidecar communication works for that, and you don't find your information here, raise an issue against this and say, you know, I don't get this, or I wish there was more details about um, what was what this looked like, and we can improve this. And that's why I was saying inside this one particular, for example, there's some there's an open issue at the moment of how to 
you know, this, this sidecar to sidecar communication for service invocation has a retry mechanism, which we haven't included inside here yet. Um, and then each one of the service invocations does point to the spec itself and then clicks on, you know, the how to. And so from here now, you know, this is the how to section that I've gone to, which is how to invoke services. So that's kind of how we arrange our docs. Uh, when we build a new feature, we try to make sure that the concepts are written and then how to is tell told you how to achieve a task. Uh, does that answer your question? And if not, uh, yeah. Yeah, except like, for example, even in the service to service invocation, how does one sidecar even locate the right sidecar? Th those I types see. of things. Yes. So, yeah. Because we, you, well, one, of the, one of the things you mentioned is that you could also run the dapper sidecar just as a process and another and to talk to another process on the host well yes. how would that work because how would everything know how to talk to each other if you did that it's Correct. Like those kinds yes. of things but, yeah so so i think in know. that case yeah in that case that you're talking about there particularly the um you're talking about certainly the uh, and, and the service invocation you're right there you know this has a concept of an invocation building block and that invocation building block takes advantage of DNS on top of Kubernetes, for example, and it takes advantage of... Um, so so each sidecar creates a service by a given name, is what, is what you're saying? Each sidecar is uniquely identified, yes. Uh, oh, well, each side... Uh, oh, I see what you mean. You're asking... In other words, the sidecar has service entries for it behind the scenes so that the sidecars can locate each other. So if you were to run something on a host, you know, with two processes on the host, because it's something that you can't containerize easily, how would, how would the rest of the world be able to hook up to that? Yes. Those, those guys locate each other, Dave, whenever you're not running inside of Kubernetes. When you're running inside of Kubernetes, they'll use Kubernetes DNS. And when you're running just as processes on your local machine, they'll use um, MDNS to do the location of other services. Yeah, I, 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 and I think that's what, I think that, that's what uh, Dave is asking, is like, just put that little bit of detail down here. Yes, okay. Good question. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, thanks. I think that kind of information can can help. Uh, is that right, Dave? Yeah, I mean, it it looks like you might be able to pull off the, you know, everything but one thing in Kubernetes. You know, where there's one one of your services has to be VM host based, and the rest are running as containers. But so would you be able to do like adding external services, you know, manually so that they could locate each other on the Kubernetes side and, and just having node ports that you put static host entries in on the host that was the one, you know, the one yeah. off. So, so that they, and, and what, what exactly would those names be, those types of things? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about a situation where you have a Kubernetes cluster and then let's say you have a, a, a separate virtual machine somewhere in the network and that wants to talk to Dapper services inside the Kubernetes cluster to tap on right, hybrid. Exactly. Standard, right, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, um, we haven't really come across uh, cases like that yet. Um, and it, it, what you said is basically right. If you use a node port, the, the services on the VM will be able to contact Dapper inside Kubernetes. And for PubSub, it doesn't matter as long as they're both connected network-wise to the same uh, PubSub event. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, thinking out loud here, if this is like a hybrid scenario, something we'd want to put in our docs, or um, do we leave that you know, to, to be, um, as you said, Dave, buried somewhere in docs? Um, Mark, what do you think about that? Uh, I think I think it's worth clarifying in the docs um, a little bit about how I mean it's certainly under the service invocation section how because uh, we don't actually say anywhere that you know on Kubernetes we hook up DNS and use service endpoints inside Dapper and you should just put that as a note and I think also you know how the 
how each one of the invocation building blocks gets implemented for each one of the different hosting platforms. I think it's worth putting it here as a note so people understand. Um, how much we have is that hybrid scenario of a VM talking up into Kubernetes and hooking them together is, is kind of new actually. So that's kind of not really an expected thing at the moment in time. But we should yeah, certainly yeah, add it. Let's, let's enhance our diagrams to, to show what is work, how it's working in Kubernetes. Yes. Yeah, we just need to have yeah. some better pictures around some of these things. And that's what I'm working on at the moment quite a bit, is trying to make sure we get some better pictures to show how the flow of information works between particularly service invocation and with the system services and things. OK, um, we have another question. If, if, do you mind if we answer another question here? So we're going to move on. Um, some questions about PubSub from Luke. Uh, if a subscription endpoint returns a non-200 status code, um, does it only retry delivering the message to a subscriber when the sidecar starts up? Yeah, so I, I, can, I can take that. I was just about to type the answer. Uh, thanks for the question, Luke. So um, this is dependent on the PubSub implementation, but the guarantee is that yes, Dapper will always retry the message once a Dapper sidecar starts up, whether uh, if it restarted or not, or whether you scaled out um, your app. So Dapper will make sure that it's retried. And then there are um, specific configurations based on the PubSub uh, message that you're putting, for example, um, intervals between um, retrying the message when a message has been uh, not acknowledged, for example. And then two is, um, I'm just going to read it and not out loud, so just a sec. Yes, currently you, you would need to basically uh, change the app ID to replay the messages. That's correct. And then Jason, uh, were both the service mesh, say Istio and Dapper provide call retries and how do they interact? Um, yeah, so um, one, one distinction between um, uh, Dapper retries and service mesh retries is that um, retries for service meshes work on an endpoint level. So you basically have a YAML file, you define that and you're basically saying um, for a given service, um, I want to retry, um, you, you know, I, wanna, I want this retry policy for that specific endpoint. Uh, with, with Dapper, we have uh, retries um, for per call basis. For example, for a state store, you can specify um, a custom retry policy when you call into Dapper. So it's a per endpoint for service mesh and, and per call for, for Dapper. Um, those are basically the, the main differences there. Hey, your own on the uh, pub sub question, isn't that, that's going to be 100% uh, for the most part, I believe anyways, that's going to be um, message bus dependent, right? So like on that first question, if a subscription endpoint returns a non 200 status code, does it only retry delivering the message to a subscriber when the sidecar starts up? Well, again, that's going to be dependent on the way that the, that the message bus is configured, correct? Um, no. So Dapper will make sure um, to basically replay. When it starts up, it'll get all the messages that have not been processed successfully from the message bus and deliver that to the application. And then on number two, when troubleshooting locally, I find the need to replay all messages from the Redis stream to a given service. The only way I can see to do this is to change the app ID. Correct. So is this to, when you say replay all messages, is this because they failed or just you want no, replay no, I, capability? I'm, well, I'm, I'm guessing because he wants to replay, just to replay the stream from the beginning. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. All right. And that again is gonna be that's going to be message bus dependent there too, because in the instance of something like service bus, if there's not a subscription that's been created, all of those messages will be gone, right? Correct. It's only going to be on, on message buses that support streams. That support, that support streams, yes. Yeah, that's right. All right, any more questions? Mark, you're still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, any more questions? If there aren't, we will close out the call and as always, feel free to post on our Gitter channel. Feel free to open up issues in our side of repo. Uh, if you always want to reach out to me in my email address, mfussel at microsoft.com, feel free to do it that way as well. Although you know, I prefer to post things on Gitter channel so that everyone can share in the answers. 
And then please look forward to the release that comes out this Thursday, so a 0 0.6 release. Try it out. Hopefully we've done our due diligence to make sure there's no regressions. We've documented all the breaking changes. We've had some great docs, but as always, it's hard to get everything right. So you know, please try it out, give us feedback, and we'll fix things up as fast as we can. And then give us feedback about what you'd like to see in the next release that will come out, which will be the summer release, release, which will be coming out in April. And just generally, please keep engaged, and we'd love to hear from you, and keep contributing or providing us feedback in any way you want. With that, I'm gonna close out the call, unless there's a final question. If not, enjoy wherever you are in the world, and uh, see you in two weeks' time. The next call that we'll have will be in two weeks' time, so it'll be on the 14th of April. Um, Yep. And then we'll have another one after that, which will be on the 28th of April. So we'll have two inside April to kind of coincide. And the one on 28th will coincide with the, the, the second release that we'll do for 0 0.7. All right. Thank you. And all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you.